Okay, welcome to Verizon Frontline 5G innovation plus reliability and resiliency and emergency response. Uh, we'll have a live Q&A throughout the session, so please open the Accelerate app, uh, select this session, and submit any questions you have, and we'll do our best to answer all of them. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce your session presenters, Brian Shromsky, Corey Davis, and Jimmy English. I'll turn the floor over to you. All right. Hey, thank you. I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, we're going to get it started with a quick video, and then we'll jump into the uh, presentation. As America's number one network in public safety, we plan for the worst, so you're ready with the best response possible. We're working to make real interoperability a reality, so first responders will be able to communicate and share mission-critical information. 5G innovations will help make operations safer, more secure, and more effective. We're committed to building the innovative network and technologies that will help first responders save lives well into the future. All right, we just wanted to provide a little backdrop of some of the things we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and first, let me introduce myself. I'm Jimmy English. I'm the Director of Public Safety for Verizon Federal. I've been with Verizon for 28 years. Uh, actually started an internship right out of preschool. They recruited early, so age three, four maybe. But, um, but yeah, it's, and I've spent about a quarter of my time uh, serving public safety. Uh, Curtis Mintz is with us today. He's with our Verizon Crisis Response Team. Uh, Curtis is going to take us through a little bit about what we do for, for first responders. Whether you're a customer of Verizon or not, we'll showcase some of the assets and some of the things that, that we show up for uh, in emergencies and other situations. And Brian Tromsky is a director on our solutions architect team. He's going to take us through uh, what the 5G roadmap looks like. So a little bit more detail in terms of um, you know, what we're doing with 5G and, and how that's going to start shaping uh, things in the future. So I'm going to kick it off here. I'm going to talk a little bit about Verizon Frontline. I uh, just want to introduce everybody to uh, Verizon Frontline, what that is. And I think this is a really good uh, slide to show the story. Uh, you know, we've had a long-standing commitment uh, to investing and innovating uh, in partnership with public safety. Uh, this timeline really shows you from 2000 to current what that looks like. Uh, and, you know, this really extends past that. This is really over a 30-year um, partnership that we've had with first responders. We've got some folks in the room today uh, that are here with Verizon. Uh, we've got a booth downstairs, so uh, we can give you more details into what this looks like and is. Uh, but bottom line, as you can see, this was built with, this was built for first responders. We have a longstanding commitment that will continue uh, in, in just making sure that you meet your mission critical needs. Hardest part of this is the clicker. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but, you know, when we talk about dedication, I think it's also important to talk about investment, right? Uh, putting our money where our mouth is. We've built Verizon Frontline right, and as you just saw, with and for first responders. Our 4G network covers more than 327 million people. We blanket more than 99% of the United States, and we're leading in 5G as well. Brian's going to talk about some of that innovation here in a little bit. But 5G nationwide is available in more than 2,700 cities. Uh, 1,700 of those cities have 5G ultra wideband, and we'll have coverage for 175 million people by the end of the year. Uh, ultra wideband is going to be paired with our 4G LTE network. So when you think about the investments that you've made uh, in devices and sensors, that will be continued to be preserved for years to come. That network will continue to operate. And I think bottom line, when you look at the numbers on this slide, uh, you know, we are continuously striving to be, and we are, your trusted partner. Uh, more first responders choose Verizon Frontline and trust Verizon Frontline. Uh, for reliable connectivity than any other network providers out there, hands down. So to have reliable connections, communications, you have to have expansive coverage, and that's exactly what Verizon Frontline provides. Open Signal designated us number one uh, in 4G coverage and video experience in the U.S. Uh, for 14 consecutive years, Verizon Frontline has been rated by J.D. Power as the best wireless experience. And for eight consecutive years, our top performance has been seen by root metrics. So when you're taking, you know, if you think about taking the best of what we have with our Verizon, Verizon 4G LTE network, blanketing more than 99% of the U.S. population, 
uh, plus the years of top ratings and experience and reliability, that's Verizon Frontline. So dedication to public safety, dedication to public safety, we talked about that in the beginning, the investments that we're making, the coverage, the reliability, and this slide really demonstrates how we're built to deliver. Um, <clears throat> Verizon Frontline is built to stay running, uh, so even in the cases where commercial power is lost, uh, in hurricane-prone areas, we can withstand Cat 5 winds. Uh, we have backup generators, we have HVAC systems, we have fiber rings on all the cell sites. And you can see a couple of the stats here, 100% battery backup, 78% permanent generator, over 530 portable assets. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit about this in the next step. Uh, dedicated sat links to all of our uh, deployable assets. Built to deliver when and where communications are needed and when they're needed most in the critical times. That's really what Verizon Frontline's about. So I'm going to play a short video here, and, uh, and Curtis is going to come up and talk a little bit more about what we do in terms of critical response. Thanks, Jimmy. Hi, folks. My name is Curtis Mentz. I manage our Verizon crisis response team for the 13 western states. I'm based out of uh, Northern California. Uh, I'm at the Walnut Creek uh, Verizon campus. It's a suburb of the San Francisco Bay Area. Been with Verizon 34 years, uh, including the uh, uh, previous company, GTE, came from the GTE mobile net side of the house. Started many years ago, but uh, it has been a tremendous uh, opportunity, tremendous career with uh, both companies. And what's interesting about uh, being with the company for uh, so many years is that we have a long, rich history with public safety, first responders, and, and the community. You know, one thing that uh, uh, folks ask me is, you know, why, why do you do this? And, uh, you know, we, we feel it's very, very important to not only support public safety, first responders in the community, but also to give back to the communities that we do business in, um, and quite frankly, in where we live. So that is a, a, a key mantra that we've got to ensure that, you know, the, the folks in the field who are answering that call for the community uh, have what they need from a communication perspective. So I'm going to talk about our crisis response team and the structure of it, how it looks nationally, some of the resources that we bring to the field, and also uh, different deployments that we've been on, and also, most importantly, how to get in touch with us should you need to uh, uh, need to help supplement some of uh, your existing resources. As Jimmy mentioned, uh, you don't need to be a customer of our program, uh, or excuse me, of our company, and we're there to assist the community and those first responders. 
So let's talk about the uh, the Verizon response team or the crisis response team. So it is a national program all activated by calling one number. And what we do is that 24-7, 365, we are a rapid response organization and we bring emergency wireless communication equipment out to the field to help supplement your existing resources. I always like to say we are there to solve those routine and complex communication challenges. And there are many of them. Being uh, someone who's uh, been around for a while and has probably gone on a couple thousand different deployments, uh, there's no rule book. There, there is no pull the guide off the shelf and in, in how to solve a, a unique issue out there. So uh, as you can see on the screen, the 800 number is there. Uh, we are 24-7, 365. I also like to say, call us anytime. We never close. So uh, you can ring that number, rings into our security control center. We have redundant centers in the United States, one in Texas and one in New Jersey, that takes calls nationally from uh, first responders and public safety organizations when they need assistance. We provide a lot of different uh, types of resources, uh, basic, all 4G, LTE basic phones, uh, smartphones, different ruggedized, ruggedized types of uh, devices. We use quite a bit and uh, Cradle Point uh, is a uh, leading brand that we carry and we use nationally hundreds upon hundreds of Cradle Point devices. We're very proud of the partnership that we have with Cradle Point and uh, most importantly, the quality of their products. We also uh, invested recently into our 5G or C band technology with Cradle Point. So we're looking forward to using all of those uh, devices in the field. Uh, so those work very well. And, and also, as I mentioned in uh, solving those routine and complex communication challenges, when we're, when we're in the field, remote areas, it could be a national force, spend a lot of time uh, assisting being from California, CAL FIRE, U.S. Forest Service. Um, what we've seen um, during the COVID days is that the fire base camps, and this is just one example, of course, we assist with, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes, I mean, you know, you name it. But one thing we saw uh, from a uh, fire perspective is that these fire base camps used to be mammoth, large uh, base camps where you'd see a couple thousand people. Well, what now what happens uh, in the, uh, you know, the introduction of the, the COVID and, and reducing the number of people, uh, they happen to split their base camps. And in, maybe instead of having one base camp with a couple thousand people, you'll have four camps with 500 people to keep the number of folks down while still a large number. Uh, it, it does reduce uh, the number of folks. We uh, have different in-building uh, resources. We also have uh, different uh, mobile assets, cows, sell on wheels, Colt, sell on light truck. Uh, we use an MCT, a mobile connectivity trailer. We also call it a spot, satellite Pico cell on trailer, uh, which is uh, pretty popular and it, it, the, the spot trailer, which uh, you saw in one of Jimmy's last slides there, that allows us to get very surgical with our deployments. It's a tow behind, uh, totally self-contained unit that allows us to move into smaller types of areas where we need to provide that 4G LT and that uh, Wi-Fi uh, in the event we go somewhere and the folks might have AT&T or T-Mobile we ensure that they can communicate also. And that's why we put either open or password protected Wi-Fi on the air. Charging stations, uh, one of the uh, uh, routinely forgotten items. Uh, we all probably have a phone with us right now, maybe two phones, and uh, we do need to keep them connected and, and charged. We use quite a bit of satellite uh, with our deployments. Um, some of you may not know this, we are in the satellite business, Verizon Satellite Solutions Group or Verizon SSG based out of Plano, Texas. We own our own earth stations. We uh, actually engineer our own satellite circuits. So we are able to uh, bring in and have on some of our 1.8 meter dishes, 100, 150 megs down, 30, 40, 50, 60 megs up we're able to engineer our own satellite circuits, and that is a very important uh, component to our um, uh, response out to the field. So lots of different uh, 
lots of different types of resources that we have, again, solving those routine and complex communication challenges. As you saw in the video, that was a recap, uh, the introduction video before I came on stage. Uh, that was our um, 2021, uh, 2021 uh, deployments and our activities. So, uh, you know, quite a bit of activity out in uh, across the country. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I have responsibility for the 13 Western states. Our Verizon crisis response team is actually split into three areas. We've got the East, supported by Jason Mitchell, and the South, supported by Earl Struble. And as I mentioned, I have the West. A couple thousand customer engagements, uh, deployments, over a thousand deployments. I mean, we do any in the West, we are clearly in that couple hundred range, well, even quite more than that. Speaking of just California, you know, clearly 150 or so deployments just because of fire season. Uh, we stay very, very busy in supporting, you know, different agencies, organizations. And by the way, it's just not public safety um, and first responders, military, uh, DOD customers, and, I, and as I mentioned, the community. A lot of different uh, devices loaned out. Uh, we touched on a couple of those different uh, phones, uh, hotspots, cradle point routers. Common question I get uh, from different folks when I give a presentation is, so with those cradle point routers, you know, we're concerned with how many people can connect in propagation and how far it, uh, um, uh, how what kind of coverage is there? So you know, easily you know, dozens of people can actually hop on to one of our uh, cradle point units. And I always like to say the propagation or how far it covers. If you were to take a cradle point and put it at the 50 yard line of a football field, it works great in both end zones. So it uh, it really does what we uh, does what we needed to do. And and as you can see, 48 states supported. Um, you know, there's there are folks who rely on us day in and day out to bring in that uh, type of communication. On the uh, right-hand uh, side of the screen, it kind of gives you a support model that we train to, that we ensure that it, it gives us our North Star as we head out into the field. So really prepare, respond, mitigate, and recover. You can see some of the different uh, items beneath each of those categories, uh, the different uh, trainings that we do with agencies. And by the way, I, I want to add this also, is that just because there is a disaster or a crisis event, yes, we will respond, we will be there, we will run to that crisis, there's no question about it. But also, we, are, we provide assistance and support during events and trainings. So if anyone is in the audience and you work for a, a public safety agency, a first responder community organization, and you've got training events or uh, across the live stream also, if you've got training events, uh, please engage us, please uh, involve us. I, I feel strongly that it's very important for us to have a great working relationship with those agencies and for you to see the equipment and how we respond and what we bring to the field and how we work with you. Uh, I've always been of the mindset that you know we talk a lot about um, different aspects of our program and, and different solutions and things like that. One thing that is uh, that you should know is that when you do call for assistance, you don't necessarily need to go, well, Curtis was telling me about this or Earl was mentioning something or Jason, my other two senior manager peers across the country. We are, we will ask you two questions. What is the mission and what needs to be accomplished? And that allows us to really target the different resources that need to help solve your issues. You don't, um, you don't need to call up and g give me 20 of these and one of those and I'll, and you can toss on a cow and a colt and uh, any other, bring your barnyard animals. And, you know, again, we, we always like to talk about what is the mission, what needs to be accomplished and we'll figure it out and we'll provide you that robust, reliable communication. So our priorities and, and different uh, uh, deployments that we do, uh, we do, you know, 
EOC support, search and rescue operations, as we mentioned, fires, hurricanes, floods, um, just different disasters uh, that are out there. We do support um, the private sector, uh, state, local, uh, federal, volunteer organizations. And, uh, you know, some people ask me, so, you know, what does the disaster need to be? Does it meet Verizon's criteria to respond? And I always like to say, call us and we will be there. If you have a need, that is our responsibility to solve it. Uh, you don't need to be concerned with, you know, is there enough damage or disaster or an event, that type of thing. It's not important. If you need us, we will be there, we will respond, and we will uh, solve those routine and complex communication challenges. We did talk about uh, assets that are available. I mentioned satellite communications. We use quite a bit of it. It allows us to put the Verizon 4G LTE network on there along with Wi-Fi. Uh, we, uh, we talked about phones, uh, different routers, tablets, um, and we, uh, we head out to the field and uh, respond. So uh, if you have further questions, we, there, it sounds like there might be a, a Q&A session at the end of our presentation. And then also we've got a booth here at the uh, Axon Show and you can swing by and pick up information. One other, I'll leave you with this. Uh, the 800 number was on one of my first slides. If you want to learn more about us and find out how we support public safety and the community, uh, verizon.com forward slash response team, verizon.com forward slash response team. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, a long, rich history in supporting public safety. Many, many years, uh, our first known deployment was in the 89 uh, Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, I started in 88, so Loma Prieta earthquake in 89. And that was uh, a while ago, no question about it. But uh, that was probably our, our first moment in time in supporting public safety. Right after that, the Oakland Hills firestorm in 91. So um, where we were out in supporting those communities. So again, we just didn't decide to show up and uh, participate and support the folks who serve others and protect others, we have a long, rich history. So I'm going to finish up with a video and invite Brian Shromsky up on stage right after the video. Thanks, folks. Thor is our tactical and humanitarian operations response platform. First responders react to situations where sometimes networks uh, may be wiped out. What Thor does is it comes in and regardless of what the devastation could be in a particular area, a vehicle like this can set up coverage and provide the necessary needs for first responders until the infrastructure gets brought back up. It has a fully enclosed network in its command center. We put the critical components of a network that would historically be in a data center in the truck, including 5G ultra wideband. We incorporated all the latest tech into the vehicle. We put what we call a Mac, mobile edge compute, on board. Now we can put applications on the vehicle. We thought it was imperative to be able to deploy Thor in a very agile and quick method. So we designed it to be controlled by a tablet. The tablet can turn up the network, raise the mass, turn up the generators, this allows us one central location to control everything on board and do it quickly. There's a door that opens up on the top. A drone gets sent up in the air, takes a video of the surrounding area. That video can get then sent back to first responders that are on the ground, and now they can see everything around them. We'd love to see Thor really evolve. We're constantly looking at new tech and new ways of incorporating new capabilities. Our job's not done. So good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Shrumsky. I lead our 5G solution architect here at Verizon. Uh, first and foremost, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, most importantly, for what you do day in and day out. It really means a lot to us and obviously for the men and women that serve and live in your community. Um, I'm a proud veteran of 23 years at Verizon, so I started the wonderful network at 2G, CDPD, that had a coverage about a, of a postage stamp. 
uh, and now we're actually going to 4G and 5G. So I've been here a long time, very excited about it. I'm very proud of what we're actually going to do. Mr. Gomez there from LAPD. Wow, look at that. We got the whole beer going. Um, so um, a lot of good things that we're going to talk about here. I'm going to talk about 5G roadmap. Ask me any question. Hopefully I have an answer for you. But I'll try to keep it real and try to be as transparent as possible. Uh, a couple of PSAs for this morning. One, um, for investigation units, we are CALEA compliant. We're actually working with law enforcement, federal, state, and local um, in terms of the control plane and some of the user plane functionality in a 5G core to be better prepared. Um, so we're actually working with our CALEA teams with agencies. So if there's any questions about that, let me know. We can conduct that. The second one, um, we are not using any Huawei or ZTE in our network infrastructure. It's probably the number one question that I get from the DOD. Uh, I support uh, my main charter is the federal government but I also work on 5G projects um, for uh, Verizon. So I'm very excited to be here. Axon's a great partner and also a customer of ours. Worked with them four years ago, getting the AB3 to actually have LTE. We're actually having conversations and how we go beyond. But we're very excited about Thor. Um, give you a little preview. We're going to expand Thor. Thor's going to get a hammer. Um, so I actually have a towaway, um, which we're very excited for. But this is a real live breathing vehicle, and there's other vehicles that Curtis mentioned and Jimmy, but the assets. But we just had this down at Sofic, a big DOD trade show, most recently in Tampa. We just did an operation with SOCOM, uh, most recently we're actually using their drone technology and actually using Thor remote area on the proving ground to actually control the drone, right? So when we look at Axon and the, some of the work that we're able to do with them, we're very excited about the possibilities for 5G and 4G technology and moving the assets. But you know, I get excited about 5G, but I also want to set proper expectation. If you know, there was a great game last night. Apparently, there was five home runs and two innings. So we are in the first inning, I would say, in 5G. It's going to take time for the folks that are probably under 30. 4G launched when you were 12 years ago, so you're probably 18 at the time. So people forget about that. Uh, LTE launched for us in 2010, so we're 12 years post then. If you experience LTE in 2010 and experience it now, it is literally night and day. Keep in mind, and I say this all the time, Uber, Lyft, and Airbnb were not thought of when we launched 4G, right? And you look at that economy and shared economy, everything is done from there, right? Whereas you look at it from a law enforcement standpoint, it used to be the vehicle, right? That mobile data terminal was your one uh, point of contact or the shoulder mic, which is still very important. But as you can see, it expand and even Axon, right? I mean. When, you know, think about this, they put out the Google Glass, right? I remember we were in San Jose, San Jose and they're doing an event and they show Google Glass like six years or seven years ago. You know, so you kind of see that appetite of being what, what's possible, right? And a lot of people ask uh, me all the time, right? It's very exciting with 5G. As my daughter's right, just requested 5G phones. Um, it's going to take time for this ecosystem to build out, right? But what we believe we're doing, just similar to what we've done in 4G, 3G, 2G, and also 1G, we're laying the foundation for the men and women in this room and the developers and application providers like Axon to build on top of that foundation, right? So what I'm gonna talk about here in the next couple of slides is really kind of understanding what our roadmap is in terms of 5G and all the pieces that go into it, right? So a couple things here, and I don't wanna to get too technical, but it is a multi-purpose network, right? So we're leveraging the assets between wireless and wireline and putting them together. At the top there, you'll see our core, um, and I'll have a roadmap on here. Today, we're on 5G, we're on release 15. We will go to release 16 on the 3GPP standard going at the end of this year, going into 2023, which is exciting. Fiber build, so fiber is a lifeblood for us as well as much as a spectrum. So we're a huge fiber infrastructure. We're right now finishing our third year of construction of 33 million miles of dark fiber. Largest purchase ever for Corning. They had to build a second plant for us in North Carolina just to keep up with the demand. So running fiber, um, which is really cool. Um, RAN, radio access network. So doing di different infrastructure, which we're very excited about that is Spectrum is the lifeblood for us. So we're, in, you know, we're on our journey round of a $65 billion investment. So if you ask if we're serious about 5G, $65 billion. It's our largest capital infrastructure project ever in the history of Verizon in 22 years. Uh, $45 billion of that goes to the FCC, goes back to the taxpayers in terms of the spectrum. Another $10 billion is capital infrastructure to actually retrofit the macro uh, cell sites themselves. An extra $10 billion is earmarked to actually get the satellite providers off of the network as quickly as possible. It is a three-year roadmap to build out the C-band. Uh, uh, and then the technology you're going to see 
A little bit different here, you'll see a lot more software-defined networking, SD-WAN, some of the tech net technology on the back end, but um, we're very excited about some of the things. And you can see it, so if you go outside the Sheraton around mm -hmm. ASU, we actually did a project with them for AR and VR, um, next generation um, immersive training. But if you go outside, you'll see the brown uh, telephone poles there. And you'll see at the top, you'll see like a large cylinder. That's actually a macro site itself on a small cell. So that's broadcasting AWS, LT, 700 megahertz. If you see a little bit below there, if our tower doesn't have the top you know, cylinder, you'll see three small, um, well, a little bit bigger, you know, about this size. Those are actually 5G millimeter wave, right? So when you talk about, and I'll talk about the spectrum here. So the lower the frequency, the further and wider you can go. So the millimeter wave, which is very important to us, is still being built out. Um, get a, like a big delay on this thing. Okay. So when we look at how we're transforming our network, you'll see new technology and a lot more virtualization. So one of the things that's exciting about 5G and why everybody's on this hype machine to some extent, and it's justified in a lot of cases because it's actually changing how we've done business, right? When we went from, you know, 2G to 3G, um, you know, we went from basically analog to digital. And then we went from 3G to 4G, we basically went from circuit switch to VoIP or all IP, right? Those are fundamental changes. When I look at 5G in my 23 years here, I think 5G, it's not the same as going from 3G and 4G, it's kind of going back to like almost 2G to 3G, right? So when you think about 02, 03, for the for younger folks in the room, this is before iPhone, for the folks in the room, this is like before even Blackberry, right? Where you had competing technologies, right? You had WAP, Brew, Right, Will, you had all these different, you know, nothing. You had, L, uh, you had uh, CDMA against GSM, right? Um, Qualcomm was still doing some things, or still manufacturing. So there was a lot of things still in the marketplace, and, you know, disruptors in the marketplace. And you start looking now on 5G, right, where you talk about private cellular networks challenging, in some cases, land mobile radio networks. This is all being festered into... I wouldn't say not necessarily noise, but a lot of confusion in the marketplace, right? But this will settle to some extent. Also, when you look from a nation state standpoint, there is fear among the US and US lawmakers, are we falling behind like countries like China, right? That actually have Huawei and ZTE, they own 30% of the patents, right? So there is a fear, it's obviously with the pandemic and supply uh, chain uh, crunch right now, in terms of having critical infrastructure and selling intelligence. So for anybody that's on a JTF, um, sharing critical information, right? There's fear, right? To actually using that network infrastructure. So this is all being fed in into the 5G ecosystem, right? Um, so when you look back on this, it's like, okay, but it just says five on my phone. What does that mean, right? When you go beyond that is there's a lot more virtualization. There's actually been a lot of economies of scale actually driving cost out of the business, but be able to do more things than you ever had before, right? So as we talked about anybody in IT, and you think of like evidence.com, right, and actually putting into a cloud service provider, right, where they use Microsoft, is you're actually moving the application closer to the edge, right? So you're doing a lot more virtualization. And we get excited with 5G in our partnership with Axon because obviously video, you know, want more board and bandwidth, low latency. But more importantly, if anybody's run VMS before, moving that application closer to the officers, the men and women into the field, is paramount. That's actually how you're going to shrink latent, you know, reduce latency and reduce bandwidth constraints is actually moving the application closer, right? So when you look at, I live in the great state of Maryland now. I come from the 51st state, which is southern New Jersey. Um, but um, we, had, we had a great event in Maryland, which I'm a big horse racing fan. Celebrating my birthday was, we're at Preakness 147 in Maryland. Um, and you look at, you know, Three years ago, previous you don't see drones, right? Now you see drones all the way, right? So the ability for, um, in Baltimore, it's got a great police department there. They actually have their own air command as well. But for departments out there that don't have the technology, don't more importantly have the resources, right? Um, how do you actually have, you know, control of a drone, right? That you want, from a search and rescue standpoint, right? Instead of having one or two choppers, imagine having 20 drones over one line, one mile long right, and actually doing wide area swaths of actually analysis. How do you control that drone, right? So that's where you get excited about talking about this technology and having 4G and 5G connectivity, but actually having that command and control software closer to the edge, so you have lower latency, right? You don't want a lot of latency because if I'm flying a drone, there's latency, right? 
I can crash into a building, right? I can crash into a pedestrian, right? So this is where it gets very exciting about autonomous vehicles and drone technology and what Axon's able to do, tying that all together, is actually pretty impressive um, and actually interacting with CAD systems. So when we look at this, that's why you see the RAM in the core, the radio access network in the core close together, but actually taking the compute and storage. So you'll actually do more functionality um, than ever before um, when it comes to 5G. Now, when we're building it out, as I mentioned, the millimeter wave was our force forte into it, ultra wide band, so running on 28 and 39 gigahertz. We have about 1,000 megahertz of spectrum there. It doesn't go far and wide, right? But this is important. So in Southern California, where we're very excited, was right there in the mid band. That's the C band acquisition there. Um, our, our first there was actually in Southern California, what's the, uh, the LA Rams uh, one. Um, actually at their home stadium there, but a huge investment there and obviously getting ready for the Olympics. But you'll see low band. So low band is also our LTE network. Um, we still have CDMA up and running here at Verizon, right? One day, I don't know when that day will come, but one day we'll actually decommission CDMA and actually refarm that. So you're looking at 850, 1900 spectrum there that you know we have different assets. The reason why the low band's ex exciting, we also have CAT-M1, a narrow band IoT in there. So when we talk about devices, right, and we talk about Internet of Things that we talked, I don't know, let's see what you told me later, um, is uh, what do we want to do, right? I don't need 5G for every different device, right? So we have another partner we work with that makes ankle bracelets. I don't need 5G in an ankle bracelet, right? It's not necessary, right? So we have a couple different networks that we can use. So LT is going to be around here in 4G for a very long time, but that's why you only see 5G in the high enhanced sets. It's expensive, the chips, right? And we have a supply chain trunk. So it will take time. So we're very excited with our partner Cradle Point. We have 5G technology in their C-band. The cool thing that I'm very excited on the C-band, we will have 160 mega, 161 megahertz of coast-to-coast -coast spectrum, which is huge because on LT, we only had 10 megahertz of the C-block. What's also very exciting for anybody in rural areas, see 5G doesn't have to be in rural, that's a big change. We have up to 200 megahertz in rural areas. So when we look at 5G technology, it is not just from a mobile standpoint, but by actually providing 5G broadband. So think about precincts, mobile command centers, actually having last mile connectivity, it's an oxymoron, but fixed mobile, that's actually what a lot of our 5G is designed to do, right? So it's a little bit different where we could expand outside of our original 13 colonies where you have like Verizon Fios, for instance, that we can then go into those particular markets. And then at the bottom there, giving a little future here, but it's uh, somewhat public, but um, satellite. So we're actually doing working with low orbital satellite providers, very excited with that partnership and actually expanding that. So when you look at, you know, coming to Verizon and, you know, the other carriers do a great job. I think it's a very good thing for us to actually have competition. It keeps us on our toes and making sure we're doing the right thing. I'm very excited that we're focused on network. We tried the AOL and Yahoo Entertainment uh, a channel. We, we learned a lot from and did better partnerships, but more importantly, going to our what we know and do very well is building networks, right? Um, so there's a clear distinction for what we're uh, able to accomplish. But we're really working with all of you out there is what are you trying to accomplish, right? We don't need 5G for everything, right? A lot of cases, if you think about parking meters today, um, I'm monitoring sump pumps, I'm monitoring radiation detection, I'm monitoring tidal stations um, for the Coast Guard, right? Don't necessarily need 5G for that. I might need 4G because I have battery constraints, right? Um, I, you know, I, I only reports once a day. I'm working with federal judges and, and devices called knuckle draggers that we put on the perimeter of, of judges' residence. So when somebody jumps the fence and threatens, which we unfortunately in the state of New Jersey, we had a, a shooting, right? The judge survived, but unfortunately her husband and son was actually killed in their own home, is how do we protect those individuals where we can't necessarily put an officer, and obviously with the ranks being few that they are right now, how do we protect and, and, and serve the community, right? It's going to take technology, right? The demand of government services will only go up. The resources to support that demand will always go down. It's the dilemma we're going to live in for the foreseeable future, right? So how can we do technology and not just jumping to the great latest and greatest? It's understanding the problem and getting the right solution to the problem, right? So 5G doesn't necessarily solve everything. It doesn't, is not designed to do so. But it opens up new avenues that we didn't have before, like 5G broadband. 
So in terms of Seaburn performance, we're very excited. Um, Axon's excited about this, and this is where we, um, so you can see the 161 megahertz, that's what we have coast to coast. But as I mentioned, we go up to 200 megahertz in rural areas, which is very nice. One of the other projects that we are very excited in its underserved community is Sovereign Nations. So we do a lot of work on Sovereign Nations and tribal lands and tribal nations. Uh, but you can see C-band, right? So 900 megabits, right? Now, what's, you know, if I'm watching Netflix today on my Verizon 4G phone, probably works pretty darn well, right? 5G, watching Netflix. Mm. But when you start doing things like AR, VR, you're doing video streaming, right, the ability. And then eventually, as we go in, I'll talk about in a second, as we make some enhancements, not just on the downlink, because this is where the change, I would say, over the last couple of years, the network was really designed, most of the cases, 80-20 rule where 80% of the requests are coming down. I'm gonna pull it down, but obviously with the me society and I have to get content, right? You know, I gotta feed that beast, right? I gotta take LinkedIn, right? Snapchat, whatever it is. Now the reverse, right? So you actually have to flip the switch, if you will. We're seeing a lot more demand being pushed up, right? Which is very exciting, right? So a little bit different there. So that's where the speed will come in there. A lot of the basic functionalities you do today, you could do today on 4G, it'll work extremely well. But when you want to get into like video and controlling a drone, not only controlling and have low latency, a lot of bandwidth, but then doing live stream video from the drone, right? Um, or towing autonomous vehicles. I don't know if everybody's walked around here. How many have seen, how many Waymo vehicles driving around here? Hopefully, right? You know, there's people in there now, but you can imagine um, when those are connected, they'll have a cellular component in there. Just like any manufacturer today has a cellular piece built into it. but You'll see the capacity, and this is why we anticipate this, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but in the next couple of years, there's going to be massive demands on there, similar to what we saw on 4G. I mean, 4G, you were getting, I mean, we had to update the contract, but you were getting like 5 to 12 megabits when we first launched. Um, with carrier aggregation and everything else, you're probably getting a couple hundred megabits um, in some cases. I was in downtown Chicago, and I was getting three, 400 megabits down, which is pretty cool. Um, so really cool stuff. And then just to close this out here, if I get next slide. Oh, let me go back on. Sorry, now we got Tourette's. Um, all right, so we're very excited. So you'll hear new terminology. Edge computing is not a new terminology, right? You've been doing, if anybody's worked in a computer class in the 80s, right, went to computer lab, you were doing edge computing, right? You had a dumb terminal and an AS400 in the closet, right? There was no compute on that terminal. It was all done in the closet. Now, that's what the cloud is today, folks. We've cut the cord and put that AS400 in some fancy data center where there's cheap power and cheap air conditioning, okay? That's, that's what you've done, right? What has changed is now from a mobile device, you know, you're not tethered anymore, right? That's all cloud edge computing is doing, right? It's actually moving the cloud. So for us, we have three cloud providers, um, Amazon, uh, Google and Microsoft Azure, right? There are three CSPs where we offer what are called mech services. Um, we have a private mech where we build out a private network, but I'll use Amazon as an example here, where we actually, so today for your mobile device, if you have your application, if your application say in Amazon today, your application's hosted there, you subscribe to Wavelength, you're on mech. Right, so MEC will work on 4G and 5G. And what happened is in our switching facility, if you ever tour one, we actually give tours. I just had um, part of the National Security Agency just came into one of our facilities to do a tour. Um, we bring them all the time, state and local. But if you go into our, our switch, you will actually see all the stuff that we have. You will see Amazon. Amazon has its own cage right there, meaning that the application gets faster not only because of the speed on the radio access network, is because that application, before it goes anywhere else, before we do an inter-carrier ex exchange or give it out the internet, the first stop would be actually at the MEC. So, you, you know, so that's where you're shrinking down the latency. It's not just speeding it up on the RAN, it's moving the application closer to the edge, hence edge computing, but that close. Eventually, and you see those base stages I mentioned earlier, the standard actually allowed the MEC to even go to the actual cell site. So when you talk about true autonomous, you're talking about a million devices on the sector of a cell site, that's where it gets really interesting. Um, but you'll see here on the MEC piece, and this is where we get excited with Axon, is how do we actually take evidence.com and actually put it closer to the edge? And you know, So that's a perfect example where we're doing from the body-worn camera, actually shrinking down that latency, not only from a radio access network, 
is actually putting the application closer on the MEC standpoint and some of the conversations we're having with them as well. And this all goes in what we call the IEN, Intelligent Ed Network, because in my world, on the federal side and state and local and large departments, you have multiple cloud providers, right? You, know, you go in the federal agency, they'll have three or four cloud providers. So the idea is to actually work and integrate depending on the cloud provider, right? Um, which is really cool. And then just to give a little bit roadmap here, so on the capabilities, I talked about a little bit of this already. On the top red bar there, that's LT that we have today, 5G broadband, also called fixed wireless access, and then voice over LT, what we've always done. So from investigation, still have a 3G, we have a 4G and 5G core, that's what is non-standalone release 15, as I mentioned, Kalia. On the bottom there, you'll see consumer and private network slices. So we're get very excited when we get into release 16, we'll have the ability to slice our network. Yes, it's slices and dices, just like a Ginsu knife. Uh, the idea is to actually take, depending what we do, say for instance for Frightline, what we're giving you is priority services, uh, preemptive services, right? QCI levels. When we get into network slicing, we'll be able to do more network attributes or APIs depending on the application. And you'll have things like user uh, policy function where you can subscribe to certain services on the fly for the duration that you need them, right? So one of the ones we're looking at um, that ever, well, the two main ones on the standards are enhanced mobile broadband and ultra low latency, right? I'm um, actually working with our product team here is was, you know, can we have a higher level or public safety slice that has higher levels of encryption in it, right? And why the slicing becomes interesting if we had a cyber attack, right? We can isolate those particular devices on one slice and then move all the traffic onto other slices, right? So it gives us more flexibility. And this is where, you know, it's really setting up the foundation for the next generation applications to build off of, right? Some of you are probably saying, what the hell is he talking about up here? But, you know, your IT departments, right? I mean, I was at IWC giving part of this presentation, right? You know, 20, well, 40 years ago, right? The LMR, that, that was the iPhone of its day, right? I mean, I come to this Axon conference, this is like LMR 30, 40 years ago. Um, it's actually, think about this, you're actually doing investigation work, recording individuals for evidentiary reasons, and it's happening like that, right? No paper, right? I mean, it's, it's fundamentally different, right? I mean. As I was texting my daughter today, I mean, I'm still amazed. I'm still a big kid when it comes to this, right? I'm in downtown Phoenix texting my daughter who's in Maryland, and with less than three seconds, she gets a text message. Now, fundamentally how that works is it has to identify me off a cell site, goes on the cell site, goes into our switch, goes all the way called the intercarrier, and then go finds her, hopefully somewhere she's at, either at school or at home at the time, finds her, and then comes the reverse trip to the cell site and goes find her. Less than three seconds thousands of miles, right? I mean, it is mind boggling, right? So, you know, that's just a simple text message, but you should control an aircraft, right? Or an autonomous vehicle, right? That's all connected. I mean, it's really cool stuff. Or a body worn camera, right? That you're streaming, right? It's pretty cool. Um, and then you start factoring things like location information, right? Or the officer, he or she, right? What was their pulse rate? You have different wearables, right? Hot humidity, temperature, right? Um, if, if that's, my, my father, when he served, you know, 12 years, he did accident, accident investigation, um, right? Now you have dash cams, all right? You have all these different sensors, technologies, right, that you can start feeding in there and get more data, um, which is really cool. So you can imagine all the data streams, and this is why 5G, it's because it's not just voice and text anymore. I'll tell you about the pandemic, is we actually saw traffic go down for the last couple of years in terms of voice and text. Actually, with the pandemic, it actually did the reverse. It actually went up, why? Because people are at home. We actually probably said this. A lot of people moving to Florida. <laughs> uh, we actually came out in order. A lot of people moving to Florida. We, we could see the migration from the Northeast and the Midwest, and now we, we know that you know majority of their time is spent in Florida. We just announced that this week, which is pretty cool. And at the bottom there, you'll see non-standalone, uh, which we are right now. So when we go to standalone in that core, when we separate the 4G and, uh, 4G and 5G core, we'll have the ability to offer things like slicing. So. You do the bottom first and then you go up and then you can have the slicing capabilities. And then lastly here, um, I don't have my patience. It's just IoT, right? So cloud integration, digitization. We are committed to ORAN. So we are part of the ORAN coalition. I know there's a lot of, I know NTIA just awarded some of the 5G challenges. Um, uh, but one of the things you have to understand, it has to work. 
just, you know, we, we do a lot of good stuff. We're building out our own core, our own cloud, if you will. We're doing a little bit things differently where we'll buy the hardware. We don't necessarily need the proprietary. Uh, we want the software. We don't need the hardware. We've learned enough that we can handle hardware. And then obviously coverage, low latency in real time. So um, to close this out, right, I have another video. So very excited for any veterans, any Marines, in the, former Marines in the room? Okay, all right, well, you're going to be mad. Any former Navy in the room? All right, well, I guess it's Army and Air Force. Man. All right, um, but I'll show you a video here. So we're very excited. Um, 5G Miramar, so in the spirit of Top Gun, coming out this, uh, this weekend here, um, two-year delay. Um, well, I can tell you a funny story here, but, um, but I'm going to show you Miramar. So this is actually, you know, um, we just did this video here, but this is actually the first 5G ultra-wideband base in the world, which is very exciting, here at Miramar, and you'll see the video from uh, individuals. And we'll hang around for any questions after that. So hopefully. Do you hear that? That's the sound of freedom. Marine Corps Air Station Miramar is home to the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing. You'll notice right behind me, we've got some F-18s, heavy lift helicopters, and assault support aircraft. Air Station Miramar is, uh, is a pretty incredible place to, to be located. We sit inside the borders of the eighth largest city in the country, San Diego. We also are happy to be a hub for innovation. An excellent example of Miramar as a test bed and a laboratory for emerging technologies is the Verizon 5G ultra wideband that is being installed right now aboard the air station. Uh, we've got just all the right pieces and parts here in the region to, to pull off something like the 5G Living Lab at Miramar. The entire six and a half square miles is the living lab. We have all the chatter, all the interferences that you would expect an air station to have on a uh, commercial 5G network. And that's what's so special about it. We get to test 5G enabled technologies in a non-sterile environment before we paint it green and ruggedize it and deploy it uh, with our troops forward. Verizon offered an opportunity for us to learn together. What does it take to operate an autonomous vehicle? What does it mean to make those vehicles connected? Learn more about the health of our disparate energy devices, our battery storage, using the energy that we're sourcing through those solar arrays a little bit more smartly. What I get excited about is thinking how 5G is going to help us to do things like biometric authentication at our entry control points. That's going to help us to do intelligent gate security. We're going to use the 5G network to tie together our perimeter security sentry towers, be more efficient, be more operationally resilient, and ultimately help us to accomplish our mission. And we want to be right there on the edge in the conversation, working together to create the most agile capability we can. Verizon more than delivered on our expectations. We had a conversation of what a 5G living lab could be. Now we have the first ultra wideband 5G small cell on any installation installed right here in Miramar. All right. I think we've got two questions. Anybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay. A couple questions in the last few minutes here. So, first, what are the speed differences between 4G and 5G for public safety, and what should we be getting as a minimum download speed for both? So, so great question. Um, so, on 4G, we have great speeds there, obviously. So you look at on 5G on C band depends if it's all in the ultra wideband family. You're looking at any 20, 30 times more, um, and that's all variable. To obviously, the location if you're on millimeter wave and mid band. But great question. Next one. Okay, and next, where are these response resources located on the west coast, and has Verizon planned for a major Cascadia earthquake in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, that was by Jason. So we appreciate it, Jason. You must be watching live streaming. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, the Cascadia rising, or the if no one knows, uh, the Cascadia subduction, it's a fault that runs, wow, clearly Oregon, Washington to Northern California, Crescent City area, certainly up into Canada. And uh, the prediction for the Cascadia sub. Uh, subduction or the Cascadia fault, should that actually move and create an earthquake? The prediction is a 9.0 earthquake that shakes violently for five minutes. So it is a significant event, no question about it. Uh, roughly five, six years ago, there was a Cascadia rising uh, 
uh, what would you say, I guess, event or training. And uh, I participated in that roughly five, six years ago, uh, Camp Murray, uh, the, the state's EOC there, and uh, visited many other EOCs. And I believe um, FEMA might be doing another uh, training uh, in that area, or maybe it's on delay because of COVID. But um, let me go back to the question. I just wanted to kind of level set there on, on the Cascadia event or um, potential of the event. So uh, Verizon has uh, resources strategically located really all across the United States. It uh, in clearly in throughout areas of Oregon and Washington and in California. We also move assets and resources all across the United States as it relates to uh, different impacts of the area. So, you know, to specifically say our equipment is located at a specific address, you know, clearly they're at our switching centers and locations and other strategic locations. So I am confident based upon various and assorted disasters all across the United States, we are uh, experts and brilliant in managing disasters, managing uh, different crisis events, moving in resources, and certainly training. We do quite a bit of training to ensure that we are there um, should the network get impacted, bringing it back on the air as quickly as possible and uh, maintaining an, an outstanding network. 